Um, thank you everybody for joining. Our speaker today is Dr. Michael Johansson at the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at the CDC. He is a biologist and senior advisor for infectious disease modeling and analytics at the CDC and is an adjunct lecturer at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health um, at the Center for Communicable Disease Dynamics. He uses statistical and mathematical modeling to improve surveillance, prevention, and control of arboviral diseases, including chikungunya, dengue, yellow fever, and Zika. He also works to improve the use of quantitative models to support decision-making related to infectious disease outbreaks more broadly. And that includes co-leading the CDC's COVID-19 responses modeling team and the CDC Epidemic Prediction Initiative. Um, he was also my postdoc advisor at the Dengue branch. And so it's my pleasure to welcome um, Dr. Michael Johansson. I just take myself off mute there. Great, thanks Talia. Uh, nice to see you. Nice to see Puerto Rico in your background there. Uh, and I see everyone on the call. So I'm gonna talk today about uh, a, a bunch of modeling work and sort of related to the theme of uncertainty uh, and uh, applications in public health. Um, and I wanted to start out with a quick, get to the first slide here, uh, a quick uh, participatory uh, prediction experiment. Uh, so I'm based in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, most of you, I guess, are based in uh, Denver, Colorado, or, or thereabouts. Uh, and so I want you to just make a prediction in your own head or an estimate, if you will, of how far it is in miles between San Juan and Denver, Colorado. So you can write it down on paper if you want, um, but, but pick that number. All right, and now I want you to make another estimate of the same thing, but make a 95% prediction interval to sort of express your uncertainty there. So you wanna be 95% sure that it's gonna be within that interval. All right, and you can write that down if you if you want to as well. Uh, so you don't have to make your predictions public, um, but what I will ask is that, uh, so I'm gonna tell you what the number is. The number is about 2,735 miles. So if you can raise your hand, if you either had the number right or if it was in your 95% prediction interval. All right, I'm seeing five hands raised, six. All right, so we have six hands raised out of 28 participants, 27 if we were, uh, don't include myself. And what we'd really like to see with the 95% prediction interval is that 95% of the predictions are within that. So that means probably, you know, the numbers aren't quite exactly right here about everyone who actually did it or can raise their hand. Uh, but what we actually tend to do is make predictions that are more specific or more precise than what we really should be doing. So one of the things we really need to be careful about is trying to really un appreciate uncertainty. And that goes for things like this, as well as a lot of our applied work. Uh, and that's sort of what I'm gonna try to focus on here. So uh, the technical themes are I'm gonna talk about are out of sample predictions. So trying to apply models to things that we don't have all the data on or that we will hold data from so that we can really assess them carefully. Uh, we just did an experiment of that where we use sort of our spatial knowledge and tried to make a prediction without actually knowing the specific piece of information. Uh, we also, I'm gonna talk about characterizing and assessing uncertainty. We also just did an example of that where we tried to express a prediction interval and then looked at how well we did on that in terms of the probability of getting that within those bounds. Uh, and then lastly, of course, linking and the evidence uh, to public health problems and in, in incorporating uncertainty in the way that we think about that. I'm gonna talk through sort of two broad sets of examples. One is looking at the spatial temporal distribution of Aedes mosquitoes in the US. Uh, so Aedes aegypti and, and Aedes albopictus specifically that are vectors of a number of important arboreal diseases like dengue, chikungunya, Zika, yellow fever. Uh, and then the second set of things I'll talk about are a bit more general about infectious disease forecasting, but with a focus on, on dengue and some examples from COVID. Uh, so here's a public health question um, that has come up a number of times. Uh, where could dengue, chikungunya, or Zika virus transmission happen in the continental U.S.? So we know that there's travelers infected, infected travelers who arrive with these diseases. Where is that a problem just for the travel population and we need to have awareness around travel, travel clinicians? 
And where is it a place where actually vector control might be important and recognizing that early to be able to stop outbreaks would be important. So that really depends on where the mosquitoes are. Uh, this is a map from 2016, 2017 of which counties in the US had mosquito surveillance programs. You can see that it's a pretty spotty map here. So we, we can, you know, our first sort of idea is, okay, well, we'll look at the data, but actually we don't have data for a lot of places. And even in lots of the places that do have mosquito surveillance programs, there's limited data and sort of an imperfect understanding. A lot of these are control set up for nuisance mosquitoes or for West Nile, and maybe aren't looking for 80s mosquitoes, which we're worried about with these particular arboviruses. So next we look to models. Uh, so we can we use that limited data that are available and then make models. Uh, here's a, these are two maps that uh, came out of CDC, so one in 2016, and these are both looking at the distribution of Aedes aegypti. So on the left is an estimated range of where these mosquitoes could be found in the U.S. in 2016. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of smooth lines there, and it's not clear exactly sort of what the evidence behind that is. Uh, for some of these places, it's very clear it's there. For others, it's not. You'll see more of that shortly. Um, and then in 2017, there were, uh, related to the Zika pandemic, there was uh, additional efforts to sort of revise these estimates. And so there was a new version that came out called the estimated potential range of where these mosquitoes might be found, not necessarily where they were found or would be found. Uh, and then there was a gradation here from very unlikely to unlikely to likely to very likely, getting a little bit at this question of uncertainty uh, about where they are. We went back and looked, checked the literature for other models like this that we could re reproduce. So we found different models for Aedes aegypti, those are shown on the left, and eight different models for Aedes albopictus, those are shown on the right. Uh, in both cases, the bottom right model is the one that was used by the CDC for those 2017 estimates that I just showed. Uh, and in all of these, the little black dots are showing where those uh, species had been reported. There's sort of two different sets embedded in here. So there's, you'll see the blue stars on some of those. Those are uh, actual models that tried to make some sort of probabilistic or at least gradations of predictions about whether they're more likely or less likely to be occurring uh, in, the, in the red areas where they're shown to be occurring there. All the other models were binary. So just saying yes or no, presence or absence, um, which we know is something that is, is a little bit, uh, misses some of the nuance. Um, and makes it much more likely to be wrong about certain things. We wanted to try to learn from all these models together. So we actually converted them all to binary models. So we tend to take first, uh, well, let me first describe the data set that we used here. Um, and I think the next slide is uh, what I was gonna talk about, the binary conversion. Uh, so most of these models had based, been based on places where mosquitoes had been, these two species had been observed. Uh, and then they call, like, essentially, they generally refer to all other locations as absence locations, or they'll do some version of an estimate of the locations where they're present, find other locations like that, and say that all other locations that are not like that are absence locations. We went a little bit beyond that. Uh, so we used, we used the data that I showed initially about where there was vector surveillance programs to also to call those absence locations where there, we knew that there was some sort of vector surveillance program uh, that existed and the species had not been reported. Uh, and then we also used um, counties where they had observed Aedes aegypti but had not reported Aedes albopictus to say that albopictus was not in those counties as well. So we sort of used two other versions of looking at absent counties to try to get a better picture of this. Uh, one of the places where this is particularly important is in like the Panhandle area of Florida there. Uh, going into Georgia, where you can see that there's sort of these uh, dark blue and light blue areas. Uh, and these are places where, you know, a lot of the climate is uh, very hospitable for Aedes aegypti, but they haven't been found. Uh, and there's actually been a lot of surveillance in some of those areas um, and, and have really shown that these mosquitoes are not there, at least over the past uh, couple decades, and certainly not there in any abundance. Um, so that's where one of the places where like this work is really sort of quite different than the sort of pseudo absence that had been used previously. We then had to convert, as I mentioned, all the models to binary models because we can't make the binary models into nine binary models. Uh, so this was the first step that we took at that where we looked at the sensitivity and specificity at the different cutoff values and sort of picked a cutoff value so that we could change each of those non-binary models into binary models and where they would just have a classification. 
And then we analyze those models against all of each other uh, uh, in terms of their classification of whether a county had observed that species or not, according to the uh, absence presence that I mentioned before. Uh, so we, we took a subset of the data, 80% uh, of all the data, all the counties that we had divided up among the presence and absence counties for both species. Uh, and we took 80% because of what I mentioned earlier, that we wanted to reserve 20% of the data so that we could do an out of sample assessment once we'd done sort of all of our model building components here. Uh, so as you can see here, I won't go through this in, in really any detail, but we can by classify and we can get measures of sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and, and overall accuracy. Uh, in particular here, I wanna focus on the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. So that's saying that if a place is predicted that it's going to be, it's going to have the species, what proportion of all those places actually have the species? So if it is predicted to be positive, is it actually positive? Uh, you can see here that the best models for um, Aedes aegypti were 85% uh, for positive predictive value, and actually for the uh, Aedes albopictus, they're up to 100%. Uh, if you look at the negative predictive value, that's uh, we predicted to be negative. How likely is it to actually be negative? You can see that these values are quite different um, and, and show that there's sort of uh, an important gap there. Uh, what we want to do is then sort of build on this and say, well, like, what can we learn from all these models together? And can we leverage the positive predictive value and negative predictive value and sort of the, our understanding of the accuracy here, here to make a better uh, map of what uh, the probability of finding these species is across the US? So. We took those binary predictions and then we converted them to probabilistic predictions based on the positive predictive value and the negative predictive value. So just as one example here, the Monaghan et al. model, um, there's an, the, there's the, that was a binary prediction to start with. So there was predicted present in some areas, predicted absent in others. We then use the positive predictive value or the negative predictive or one minus the negative predictive value to get a uh, the probability that, that is positive given that designation in the model. And then we update the model to say what the probability of presence from that model is. So in all counties that were predicted to be positive, we say that there's a 63% chance that those counties are positive. And to all the ones predicted to be negative, there's an 11% chance that those are positive because we're trying to frame this all in the po pro probability of presence. Once we do that for all the models, we can then average across those and we get an ensemble prediction, taking into account all the different model approaches and the different accuracies of those different models. We then used a logistic regression model, a general GAM model, a general, generalized additive model to calibrate that, to uh, adjust those, the probabilities coming out of that ensemble to more match the scale of probabilities that we actually expect to see, the result of which I'll show you in a second. These are what those updated maps look like. So we just do the process that I just went through. Uh, and so then we get the scaled probability of presence for all the counties in the United States. Um, I guess there's not a whole lot more that I wanted to say on this slide here, except that you can see pretty clear distinctions between the different species. And you can see that there's areas where there's really high probabilities of presence and other areas where there's really low probability of presence. Probably the, the whites are not as white as they should be here. So um, there's like, you can see like much of the Northern US is, is not actually white for uh, zero probability of prevalent pre presence, um, but it's actually sort of in the in the 10% range. Uh, and that's because none of these models are particularly good at saying there's absolutely no chance that the mosquito is located in this place. And if it's not, if it can't do that in one place, then you can't infer that about another place, whether you have data for that or not. Uh, we can look back then and say, okay, we have an independent data set here. How does this new model, this ensemble do in terms of classification compared to all the others? And here it's just in sort of ranked order based on the accuracy for the classification. You can see it's the second best model for Aedes aegypti and the second best for Aedes albopictus, but actually pretty comparable to the best models um, and, and sort of more of a balance between the, the sensitivity and specificity. Um, this is not the be all and end all though, because this is going back to binary classification. Actually, what we have now is more robust information than that. Just to give you one example of this, uh, this is Leon County, Florida, which is where Tallahassee is. It's in the panhandle. It's one of those areas that most of these models have predicted to be positive, but actually has had no observations. 
So it's never been reported there. The Monahan model uh, said that uh, the probability of presence there was present. It was a binary model. Uh, and if we look at similar predictions from that model, and we look at, for this, I looked across the training and testing data set, about 65% of those uh, were actually positive, right? So it's present uh, is the prediction, but only 65% of those similarly classified counties are actually have the species observed. Uh, if we then go to the Johnson model, which is the CDC model um, used previously, uh, the probability of presence for that county was 60%. Uh, and if we look under that model for similar, predict similar predictions, we find that about 80% of those were positive. Uh, so that's good in the, in the fact that like we're, you know, it, it's sort of, the, the, you know, there, there's some agreement there, um, but actually, you know, the 60% is not the same as 80%. And we want to, for it to be probabilistic, we want to be able to say as close to that 80% as possible uh, and sort of be close to that. But that's looking at across many counties. If we look at the ensemble here, it's an 80% probability of uh, presence. And if we look across all counties uh, with similar probability of presence, it's 86%. So that's a much closer number there. Uh, if we look at any given county, these are gonna vary quite a lot. So what we really wanna do is look across many counties, but we wanna get to sort of a pre uh, probabilistic predictions of this nature that we can equ equate to things like saying there's a 20% chance of rain tomorrow or an 80% chance of rain tomorrow and then decide whether we wanna have an umbrella or a rain jacket or whatnot. This is a way that we can look at how that classification works and whether a model is well calibrated in terms of specifying those uncertainties well. Uh, so we can start with the upper left panel here and I'll just talk through this one in a little bit of detail, but essentially we can look at the, the different probabilistic predictions from the model on the x-axis and then compare them to what's actually observed on the y. So we just looked at one specific example of that. Uh, but if we take it, for example, all of the predictions made by a particular model that, that give an 80 to 90% chance of observing Aedes aegypti, we can then uh, look at the data point. Uh, we can look at all the counties that had that prediction and say, okay, out of all those counties, what proportion of those actually had aegypti in the observed data set? Uh, I don't, can you see my cursor here? Okay. Thanks, Talia. So that's corresponds to this point here. And you can see that it's like 80, around 85%. And there's some uncertainty because there's not a lot of counties that actually have that. So the, the, the length of this uncertainty bar here reflects the amount of data you have to draw that conclusion. Uh, so if we look across all these different proportions, we can say, you know, here's the 50 to 60% range. And it's actually, you know, just under like 53% or something like that. So what you wanna see is the predictions falling across, along this line that is saying that there's a rough correspondence between the probability that you're assigning and the probability that's actually being observed. So we can see this here in the training data, which we essentially fit the model to up here in the upper left for Aedes aegypti, upper right for Aedes albopictus. And then we can also see it in the testing data and there's fewer testing data because it's only 20%. So there's more uncertainty here, but essentially in all the cases we're crossing that bar of, of the the sort of one-to-one -one correspondence that we're looking for. So this is saying that our model is relatively well calibrated so that that 80%, when we see the 80%, we can rely on that even though it's not always gonna be correct. It's only gonna be correct around 80% of the time. There's other things that the probabilistic predictions can, can help us look at. So here's looking at uncertainty. We're looking at it here as a function of entropy across all the different models. So basically, uh, if it's white, they're saying there's very little variation across the models. Uh, so you can see in the southeastern US for Aedes albopictus, basically everyone's predicting uh, Aedes albopictus to be there. Uh, if you look across the uh, sort of the, the darker green area, that's where there's a lot of uncertainty across models. Uh, so the, the dark green areas are the areas where um, there's, there's disagreement um, uh, across models and areas where either you know, there's, there's room for improvement in the models, trying to figure out what, what's sort of missing or what's different between them, something which ha we haven't gone into any depth on yet, um, or also look at data, right? So data is another piece of this puzzle and having more data for those locations could provide a lot more resolution uh, on what might be happening there. So the probabilistic, uh, probabilistic way of looking at this also gives us more information on, on sort of how we could target surveillance to help reduce some of the uncertainties that we have. We can also look at the residual bias here. So this is just taking those probabilistic um, uh, 
predictions and then comparing them to whether uh, the species has been observed or not. So again, it's broken down by the two species and by the training data set and the testing data set. And what we can look for here is if these are random errors, we would expect those to be sort of randomly spotted across those different locations. But in fact, they're, they're quite clearly not random for the most part uh, in some areas that it might be. If you look again at the panhandle area for Aedes aegypti, you can see it's predicted to be present uh, in many counties there, but is, is actually absent. So there's, there's something that the models are missing there compared to the data. Uh, if you look in Southern California, you can see that there's an, there's an area where um, Aedes aegypti is predicted to be absent, but has actually been observed. Uh, and that might be sort of related to more recent data uh, and more recent invasion of the species in, in some of those areas. Uh, same can be seen in some of the testing data. So another sort of way that this provides insight on, on both the data and what our understanding of the locations of these species might be. So probabilistic predictions in this work, uh, they've allowed us to ident identify and characterize some of the uncertainty that we have. Uh, that, that also then leads to being able to identify some of the data and modeling gaps, so things that we could do to improve our understanding of these and allows us to explicitly consider the kinds of uncertainty that we have when we're thinking about things like the risk of spread of, of arboviral diseases in these areas. There's also limitations. So there's the, there's the model biases that I already mentioned. Um, we used uh, historical observation data here, but actually those distributions have changed a lot over time. Uh, so these models are basically just like, has it ever been observed in that location? I mean, it's over several decades of data but actually those things are dynamic. We also don't know what the seasonal season, seasonality looks like here. So if we wanna think about vector control, when do we have to do it? Does it matter if uh, infected cases are arriving in December versus arriving in June and July? Uh, it almost certainly does, but it depends on where you are. And we don't have that characterized here. Um, there's also much bigger questions about like what this, these distributions look like globally. And we can learn from this kind of approach, I think for not, not only for 80s, but for other species as well. For 80s, we went a step further and then set up a, an actual forecasting challenge to ask a more specific question about prospectively, what is the probability of collecting 80s aegypti in a subset of counties on a monthly basis for the year of 2019? We did that for both 80s aegypti and 80s albopictus. Uh, and this is important for thinking about questions like which counties in a given state are likely to have Aedes aegypti. So how can we sort of better define that distribution of Aedes aegypti, both in space and over time within a season and as it changes over, over years. Uh, are counties likely to have Aedes aegypti in December? Uh, we can ask a number of sort of questions of this nature. We set out to do this challenge by sort of starting to work with a number of public health authorities and vector control agencies across uh, eight different states, as well as a lot of modeling groups who had sort of worked on models like this in the past. Uh, and we collected data from 95 counties across eight states. So this is really a wealth of data that I'm showing here. Uh, it includes data from 628,000, more than that, con collections of uh, mosquito traps. So here I just represented the, the, the like vertical axis here is years. And so each little square in there is a month. Uh, and if there is a, a box that's gray, that means that their traps were set out. Uh, and if there's a red box, it means that the Aedes aegypti that were collected. If it's blue, that means the Aedes albopictus were collected. This is the kind of really detailed data that allow us to build more complex models and, and really look at the distribution of these species over time and how it's changed. You can see some of these areas like Orange County, California on the left here uh, is a place where they, they had been doing a lot of trapping in the mid like 2013 to 2015, and had not found Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus, saw the invasion of both in 2015 and sort of the establishment of them in the subsequent years. You can see others like Riverside where they had the same thing happen for aegypti, but not for albopictus. In San Diego, they had albopictus, but then it didn't really get established, whereas Aedes aegypti did. So there's a lot, wide variety of things that are happening here. If you look in the Northeast, you can see lots of albopictus and, and no aegypti. Uh, but if you go down to Florida, then you see sort of this mix again. So this is really a lot of data. It's publicly available. So if other people want to work with it, uh, you can find it there. Teams then made real-time forecasts going through 2019. So every month predictions for the following month were due uh, at the end of the month. 
Uh, and this is what those predictions look like. So every little line in here represents the prediction from one team for one, uh, one month, but monthly predictions over the year. Uh, the red is Aedes aegypti, the blue is Aedes albopictus, and then the, the thicker lines are the, the ensemble. So it's a median of all those individual team forecasts. This is actually the first time that we used a median to actually calculate ensembles, which is something that we're now doing uh, for many of the COVID forecasts based on sort of this early work where we saw that actually made a difference compared to using a mean here. Um, here again, you can see that we're getting a lot more uh, distinction between like what's happening in different places. So you have strong seasonality. You can particularly see it like in the Northeast for the Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus over here. You can also see a real differentiation between some locations and what species are here. Here's Riverside, where it's uh, like high probability of aegypti most of the year, very low probability of albopictus. Orange County, where you have a high probability of both throughout the summer months, and it sort of drops down. So we're getting a much more nuanced picture here of, of, of where these species might be. This directly translates to that the, the panhandle area that I mentioned before. Uh, so these are all those models that I showed back at the beginning, previous models of Aedes aegypti. And basically the panhandle is always dark red uh, in all of these, no matter how you look at it, uh, including in the ensemble prediction that we put together. But if you look at the ensemble predictions uh, from the, the forecast models for, so this is specifically looking at August, 2019, August being the month when we're most likely to see them for all of these panhandle areas, the probability of presence was less than 0 0.1. So many of them are actually saying that there is some possibility that it's there. So it's not a 0% probability, but actually that it is very low. And that much better reflects what we actually know about the data. Um, we're still, we still haven't dug in thoroughly to these results. We were starting to do that just as COVID hit and everyone got distracted, but we are picking these up again now. So we'll have more um, we'll have more results on these, but I did want to uh, show a few of the early results from that. Uh, so one thing, we this is on a subset of the, all the observed data. The county level data is really painstaking to collect. Uh, so we didn't have all of it at the time we were doing this. Um, there were uh, six, all right, so this is the, sort of we looked at the average skill of all the models here using a proper score. And so this is taking all, talk a little bit more about this later, but it's taking into account both uncertainty and sort of the um, accuracy of the predictions. Overall, the best model was the ensemble. So when we combined all models, we were better than using any single one model. Uh, this model number eight here is uh, based on just the data reported in the previous year. So if we say, if we take that last year of reported data, 2018, say, okay, what do we expect in 2019? This is what, about what we'd expect to see. And you can see that six of the models in addition to the ensemble did better than that. So that's a sign in the right direction that they're picking up on something. Um, we have a number of additional analyses planned here. So that includes uh, looking at differences in predictability. So are there particular locations that they were easier to predict than others? Are there things like the bias that I mentioned earlier that can we can detect among these that can sort of highlight areas where we can areas for improvement. Are there differences across modeling approaches? Like are those upper six models doing something fundamentally different than what the lower models were doing? Um, and then we can look at some of the characteristics that might be associated with that. Uh, you know, one of the ones we're particularly interested in is are, are there some models that are like better at predicting areas where there's new invasions occurring uh, of these species? So more to come on that, um, but I think uh, a lot of interesting, to me, a lot of interesting results coming out of this first iteration and even the first look at the results too. Uh, so now I'm gonna shift topics a little bit and talk a little bit more about forecasting. So uh, the general question here is how bad is the epidemic gonna be? Uh, are cases likely to go up? Um, uh, one, a little bit more specific example here is for dengue in Puerto Rico. Uh, and so this is looking at the San Juan metropolitan area over uh, a couple decades of data. So you can see here that dengue is basically always present. It's been a bit more of a complex picture since uh, Zika showed up in 2016. I'm not gonna talk about that today though, but this is a typical picture for dengue endemicity, whether it's San Juan, Puerto Rico or any other place where dengue is endemic. We have a strong seasonal signal. So you can see those little bumps that are happening every year. 
But then every few years, there's this big epidemic where it just shoots up. And so you go from seeing three or 4,000 cases in a typical year to seeing 15,000 cases or 20,000 cases. This is then like a huge burden on the hospital system. So the kinds of lines that we've seen with COVID are things that are very typical in places where major dengue epidemics are happening. If we can detect those earlier, there are some opportunities to do control, uh, but there's definitely also opportunities to improve the access to care and sort of do triage and that kind of thing in hospitals, which is now always done retroactively sort of in response when it's already too late, rather than trying to do those things and plan them ahead of time and, uh, and really save lives by doing that. Because one of the critical things with dengue is getting the most critical cases, which are a subset of them all, care as quickly as possible to help save lives. All right, so here's your chance to do dengue forecasting. So this is another experiment that you can do internally. Here's four years of data, uh, 2008 to 2012. Uh, you can see that there's some seasonality in here, but it's a little bit hard to see that. Uh, I'm gonna start showing you data now from the next season. Uh, so here are the first eight weeks of data. Uh, and you can make your internal prediction. Is it going to be, you can do a simple version of, is it going to be a bad season or is it going to be uh, a sort of a normal season? But you could also, if you want, assign a probability to that of 80% chance it's going to be a bad season or whatever. Here's a few more weeks of data. All right, you can make another prediction, update, update your priors now. Here's another. All right, uh, do we think we're, we're, we're certainly not in the normal territory anymore? Is it time to go down? or do we think it might go up? All right, uh, it kept going up. What do we think is gonna happen next? Uh, might it go up more? Might it go down? Your hospital's probably already set up triage now, but can you, can you plan for the end of that or do you need to be ordering more supplies? Okay. And then finally it starts going down. So this is the kind of thing that would be really helpful to have more insight on in real time. Uh, and, and hopefully your, your internal model of whether it was gonna be a bad season or not gave you some insight on how difficult that might be to predict. We know that there's a lot of things related to, to dengue transmission that could help us predict. I'm just gonna go through very briefly a couple examples here. Uh, so this is work that we've done uh, on looking at the transmission biology of dengue. So if you look at how long it takes the virus to replicate within the mosquito in order for the mosquito to be able to transmit it, that's highly dependent on temperature. This has been known for a long time. Uh, if you look at how long mosquitoes survive, it is also highly dependent on temperature that's shown on the right here. Uh, so up to a certain point, the, the survival really increases as temperature increases, but beyond that point, then survival decreases because it becomes too hot. Uh, we can also look at the geography. So if we think on the ecological scale, there's very clear signs of dengue being important there too. Here's a study where we looked at dengue on islands across the world. Uh, we found that the probability of the islands having reported uh, outbreaks at all was partly dependent just on whether there was enough people there to have an outbreak that's shown on the left. Um, but the probability of being suitable for actually having outbreaks was really predominantly dependent on temperature. So areas with hotter temperatures were more likely to have dengue outbreaks um, than, than areas with cooler temperatures. Not a huge surprise, this parallels the global distribution of dengue that we already know about. And then within those islands where it was suitable for dengue and there's enough people to have an outbreak, uh, we found that the, the frequency of outbreaks was related to population size and also rainfall. So wetter environments are also necessary for, for having this transmission of mosquito-borne diseases. Though there can also be a trade-off there depending on some of the um, flooding dynamics and the, the specific mosquito habitat dynamics. We've also looked at this in Puerto Rico where we looked at really the, the impact of climate plus weather together. So we know that there's these like global distribution patterns and those patterns are also true within Puerto Rico, but we actually have dengue cases throughout Puerto Rico. Uh, so if we look at the, if we sort of remove the seasonality and look at how short-term temperature, like temperature over from this week to next week, or precipitation from this week to next week, just over the last few weeks could impact additional increases or decreases in transmission uh, this week or in the coming weeks, uh, we can then sort of fit models to that and get coefficients out of those that, that show how, how strong the impact of short-term precipitation and temperature is on dengue incidents uh, across the, the municipalities of Puerto Rico, 
So the red municipalities here are municipalities where precipitation on the right has a particularly strong effect. And on the right is where temperature has a particularly strong effect. This correlates really well with the climate within Puerto Rico because the, the sort of the Southern area, uh, if you look at the precipitation one, the Southern area where all these uh, red municipalities are, these are the areas where they're the driest part of Puerto Rico, like where you can see cactus and uh, sort of really dry forest plants and that kind of thing. So these are the places where the drier places precipitation is most important. And here's the cooler areas up in the mountains where temperature is most important. So not only is there sort of this effect of climate, but there's also more local effects, uh, local in time and, and geography of, of what the sort of short-term temperature and precipitation is doing that impacts climate. We can then look at what the impact of, of climate variables are on dengue transmission at, a, at, a, at larger scales. If we think about forecasting as a way to, as a way to look at this, here uh, I'm, I'm looking at mean absolute error for uh, like month ahead forecast predictions. If I were to redo this study, I would look at a probabilistic outcome rather than error, so don't hold me to that. Um, but I think it still gives a pretty cool, clear picture of what we're looking at and that we would find uh, similar results if we looked at a probabilistic outcome. So here's a very simple model. We say next month looks like an average of all the pre previous months. We can then go forward and say, okay, how, how off am I in my forecast um, when I look at these predictions? Uh, and so it's a flat line saying like, no, no matter how many months ahead, if I predict on the past month, this, these all have similar er errors and they'll be about by uh, 1500 cases. Uh, if I, instead of that, I say, okay, I actually know that there's seasonality here. And instead of accounting for that in some specific climatic way, I'm going to say every future January is going to look like the average past January. Every future February will look at the average past February. So I'm sort of accounting for seasonality without explicitly incorporating climate variables. So that's what this looks like. So we get a reduction in the error, so more accurate predictions. All right, I actually know that biology is important here. So let's say I use temperature and say, I'm gonna put in lag temperature and try to understand that impact. Uh, there I actually do slightly worse than if I'm just using a monthly mean. It's pretty similar to that, but a little bit worse. So I'm probably getting a little bit of overfitting in the model there that's characterizing something in a way that actually degrades the performance a little bit compared to just using the historical data on its own. If I then say, okay, we also know that Dengue is an infectious disease, so the number of people infected this month is going to have something to do with the number of people infected next month. We actually can do a lot better when we look at a one month ahead prediction, uh, but that that then degrades as we move forward to, to further months looking further into the future where the number of cases last month has less correlation with what's going to happen in the coming months. If we then do autocorrelation and seasonality, so seasonality here excuse me, uh, is using a, a seasonal autoaggressive model. Uh, we can then see actually that we get a lot of improvement in, in terms of what that prediction is. So even though we know that there's this temperature should have this important relationship, and in fact does have an important relationship, it's not actually doing as well for prediction uh, as using a simpler model that's just basically using historical seasonality and autocorrelation. That said, that model is still not super helpful. So here are predictions from that specific model for Mexico, looking at the predictions with the uncertainty incorporated. You can see that at the one month ahead, like you're getting fairly good alignment of the mean predictions and the, the uncertainty with what the actual observed uh, values were, the observed values being in the, the black dots. Um, but actually there's a bit of a lag here that's hard to see on this time scale, but they're still, they're sort of doing okay, right? So that at this point, when you're here, like you know that things are going up and they're not over yet. There's some strong signal of that. But actually, once you get out to the two month ahead forecast, you don't really know if you're looking two months ahead, whether it's gonna be the worst season that you've ever seen or the, the best season that you've ever seen uh, in terms of incidents. So it, it like, even though it's the most accurate forecast, there's a lot of limitations to how useful this forecast would actually be in real time. So again, thinking about the, cl the climate piece, um, I guess I already mentioned all of this. So I, I don't sort of need to go back through that, but uh, take them here being that weather on its own doesn't drive the big dengue epidemics and we need to look at other factors that contribute to that. Uh, 
we've looked at many other dengue models. There are many other dengue models out there. Uh, that is also true for many other infectious diseases. Uh, and so this is sort of a common problem that we look at all the literature and there are so many models out there. They're mostly using very different data. They're retrospective analyses. So something published this year on data that were collected five years ago and analysis that was done three years ago. And we don't really know that that was actually prospective and um, out of sample data. They use different targets, different things they were trying to forecast, also different ways of evaluating the forecast. So we end up where we really don't know what models we should build off of uh, and little sense of whether the models that already exist are appropriate for using for decision making. Uh, and the result of that, that is that few quantitative models are actually being used actively. And that's, that's changing pretty rapidly, but um, uh, is really, I, I would say, the sta status quo still. Um, so given all of this, we, we, we started to take another approach, um, which I already mentioned earlier for the 80s forecasting effort, but trying to do this more broadly. Uh, back in 2014, we started the Epidemic Prediction Initiative at CDC really just try to build communities around these kinds of forecasting challenges where we already saw the work going on, but we couldn't really evaluate it. And we didn't know that it was really ready to be applied to public health. So we've done this for influenza, we've done it for dengue, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about the dengue results. Uh, as I mentioned before, we did it for these mosquitoes in 19, 2019 and 2020. Uh, we did a West Nile challenge in 2020, uh, right as COVID was starting. Uh, we're gonna we're planning to get another one on the on the ground this year in 2022. We'll hope to announce that later this month. If anyone's interested, feel free to email me. Uh, we've been doing it for COVID-19 uh, since early 2020, uh, and then we've uh, restarted hospitalization forecast for influenza just recently as well. Uh, so there's a lot of other ways to engage on this if people are interested. Um, one of the things that we realized early on in this is that we need to get beyond point forecasts. So here's an example of why. These are three different dengue forecasts. This is for the same outcome of that red curve that I showed you earlier, looking at early forecasts in the 2012-2013 season. Uh, so these are three different teams uh, where they're predicting when the peak was most likely to happen. So this is a point forecast, week 23, week 23, week 22. The actual observed peak was week 32. So that peak was much later than anyone had expected that year. We can look at error metrics on these. Uh, and so the errors there are nine weeks, nine weeks, 10 weeks. So we can easily say like, okay, none of these were particularly good models at predicting this. And they all seem sort of equally bad, although two of them were like slightly better than the other. If we look at the probabilistic prediction for these, we actually get a much better sense of sort of the subtleties that are in these models. So these are those same three predictions. Uh, the point prediction is indicated with the arrow, uh, but these are actually probabilistic predictions where each column is the probability assigned to that, that week being the week when the peak occurs. Uh, so if you add each of these up, the area under each of those bars adds to one. Uh, so that they're all equivalent in that sense. So they're all assigning 100% probability across these different weeks, but they assign those probabilities in a very different way. If we then look at when the actual peak occurred, uh, we can see that uh, the model one assigned uh, a 2% chance essentially that the peak would occur that week. Uh, model B assigned a 4% chance that it would occur that week. And then model C assigned a 0% chance that it would occur that week. So these can be characterized as the probability, right? The P, uh, and then we can use a proper score, which the log score is what we used in this case um, to calculate the score based on that a probability assigned there. Now using this log score uh, for this toy example, doesn't really matter. You can see it better with the probabilities, but it gives uh, mathematical guarantees about sort of performance when you start comp comparing many forecasts against each other which is of course what we want to do when we have many forecasts over many years from many different models. So here's a look at those log scores across uh, four different seasons here that we're looking at out of sample predictions for. Um, this is a little bit hard to read. So let me just sort of walk through one of them to give you uh, a sense of what's going on here. Uh, so each of these points here, like the points uh, in each line represents uh, the average across four seasons for, for a specific team for the specific week when the forecast was made. So they were made in four week increments. Um, and these are weeks of the season. So moving through the season here, uh, the gray area is like the first half of the season. 
Uh, and then closer to the top is a is a higher log score, which is a more accurate forecast based on the metric that I just shared. So you can see in all of these, the forecast, well, okay, in most of these, the forecast accuracy increases as the season goes on. So that's a good thing. That means we're incorporating the data that's coming in and be, having a better sense of when the peak is. If you remember back to that red prediction, it's actually helpful for us to know when we're at the peak. So if, we're, if, we're, if we can say at that point that it's likely we're at the peak or that it's likely that we haven't hit the peak yet, that's still useful information, even though we're already well into the season. Forecasts generally are not very good early on the season. Um, there's three other models here that I want to mention. So one is the uh, a null model here, and that's just saying like in this case that we have no idea. It's equal probability across all weeks of when it would happen. Uh, and you can see that there's some models that are actually worse than that, worse than saying that they don't know. And this is kind of overconfidence uh, in whatever they think is going to be the outcome at the beginning of the season. Another model here to look at is uh, the baseline model. So that's this um, sort of dashed line here. Uh, and this is exactly the model that I showed you for Mexico. So it's a seasonal ARIMA model. So it's accounting for autocorrelation and seasonality based on historical data. And you can see that for peak week, it actually ends up being the best model, even compared to all these, the models that the teams contributed. Uh, it's peak week both here in Iquitos and in San Juan. It was not the best model for peak incidents, although it was pretty good uh, in Iquitos. Uh, also not for, for total incidents, though it didn't do terribly there either, although it was not great here in this case for Iquitos. Um, the other model then to look at is the ensemble, which is this dashed or sort of the dot dashed one, I guess, the finer dashed, uh, this black one here. You can see that that generally performs among the among the top models, uh, and it does that for all of the different outcomes. So, like I showed earlier with the 80s, in this case, it's not the top model, but basically all the time it is one of the top models, and all that is is a simple average from all of the other models. So it's a fairly easy thing that we can that we can do. Um, overall, the insights here were that the, the, the current models had low skill early in the season. Some models sort of showed enough accuracy around the time of the peak that they could be useful then. So once you're well into a season and you have some data on that season, it could be useful. Those baseline models that I talked about often outperformed many of the more complex models and all, some of the time outperformed all of them. We also looked at the time, types of models that were employed and we specifically found that the mechanistic models uh, generally were not performing as well as the statistical based models. And that I don't think is an is a indictment of mechanistic models, but rather an indictment of sometimes having overly complex models for being able to fit the data and sort of the the statistics that are actually helpful in uh, accurately describing uncertainty, which is more difficult to do generally in mechanistic models, but certainly possible. Uh, we also found the models that use climate data were less likely to be uh, among sort were like had lower skill in general than models that didn't use climate data. Again, we know that climate data matters, that climate matters for dengue transmission. So it's really about how that's integrated in the model. Uh, lastly, that ensembles generally performed well. A few other things to sort of mention here. Um, one is we've really seen this advantage of the ensemble across all the different uh, modeling exercises that we've done. Uh, here's some examples from flu seasons on the right here, individual team models in the like dash black, ensemble in the dark black. Um, we found that even for individual models, that is uh, like the, if, if a team uses an ensemble within their own approach, they also tend to have a more accurate model than, than the models that don't do that. So if you're actually thinking about making predictions, I think it's always valuable to think about an ensemble approach, whether you're a participant or whether you're trying to ingest models to use. Um, I think part of the reason that that is, uh, is thinking about sources of uncertainty. So there's sources of uncertainty in the outcome, like there's just variability in case counts on a week to week basis or whatever outcome it is you're looking at. There's variability in what data people are using to put into models. There's also variability in the way people specify their parameters in their models. All of these things are, are sort of things that you can account for in a single model where you're like varying some of the inputs and in the ways that you're dealing with pieces of that but it's much harder to uh, incorporate structural uncertainty. So like using a Surima model versus a mechanistic model. There's, there's like preliminary assumptions that you're making there just by the choice of model that you're using. 
that are much harder to do and sort of variation across a single model. So I think that's one of the real uh, strengths from bringing this approach that is hard to do otherwise. Um, the for the we've also done a lot of sort of follow-up work on ensembles uh, looking at, in particular at real-time weighted ensembles so uh, most of the model ensembles we've done have been like weighting all models equally either through a mean initially or then more we've moved towards more median ensembles as i've, as I've talked about uh, for covid we've been really trying to figure out how to do weighted ensembles in a dynamic way uh, because we have different models as we get the COVID forecast in each week. Some models are, are submitted some weeks and then not others. So we need to be able to adapt to having different models available at different times. We need to adapt to sort of having different dynamics of the epidemic over time. So if we want to just use recently submitted models, we, how many weeks of historical data do we need to be able to sort of set a reasonable bound for that? Um, what is the outcome metric do we, that we want to look at? Do we want to sort of weight across uh, cases and deaths for you know, using the same weighting scheme? Do we want to weight across all states at the same time? Do we want to weight across states and the national forecast? Uh, so there's a lot of different decisions and sort of pieces in there. Uh, I think we've made a lot of progress on that front. Um, on the right here, I'll just highlight one of the figures here. The um, Let's see, I think this one here shows that the deaths figure on the upper right. So this is using uh, the weighted interval score, which is another proper score. So a score that incorporates both um, sort of the accuracy and the precision part. So incorporating the uncertainty. Um, the, the weighted median ensemble is the dark blue here. So this is the current version of the model that we're using, which is a trained model. Uh, and then the, the light blue is an untrained model. So that's like just an, uh, an equal weight for all models. And then the black here is the baseline model, uh, which is sort of assuming a flat projection moving forward. So you can see that both of these across this whole time scale, both the blue models are outperforming that black model. And then there's consistent performance of the dark blue model uh, be being better than the light blue model over time. So here we, we've started using that trained ensemble. If we look at cases, we can see that that is generally the same case here, but there are times when actually the the untrained ensemble does a lot better. So we have not switched over to using that uh, for cases yet. So we're constantly building these. And this work all comes out of that er like earlier work on dengue influenza um, that we built there. Uh, all right, I think I'm going on longer than I meant to. So I'll try to just mention this briefly. This is one of the other things we taught. I showed earlier some slides of calibration for, um, for the 80s uh, models. These are actual ones from influenza, and you can see very different pictures here. So this is a well-calibrated model. Ensembles tend to be well-calibrated. Uh, here's an overconfident model, uh, and this is what we tend to see more from teams. And this is like what we saw from participants on the, in the call at the beginning, where we say, okay, we're 95% sure it's gonna be within this interval, and then it's not. Uh, and this is so like here, we're very confident it's gonna be here, but actually it's only there like 30% of the time. Underconfident is saying, okay, there's a 60% chance it's gonna happen, but actually when we say that, it happens 100% of the time. We also see this sometimes in ensembles. No confidence is when we never say it's very likely to be any one thing. Uh, and no resolution is like, no matter how confident we are, it has the same probability of actually being there. So these are things that are actually, I think, really helpful for looking at when we're evaluating models. Um, we see the same thing for uh, COVID forecasts. Majority of team forecasts are overconfident, so they're showing up in, in this realm here. Ensembles like the green and uh, the, no, sorry, the red here is the ensemble, uh, tend to characterize the uncertainty um, much better. Uh, so this is my, I guess, second to last slide here. Uh, so we, we've been doing a lot of work on like real-time probabilistic predictions. Uh, so these, I think, are really valuable for trying to get to the point where we're providing real-time information to decision makers. These are the current uh, forecasts for COVID-19 deaths in the United States. These are national, uh, national level ones. They're also available for all states. They go for the next four weeks. You can see the individual team forecast there on the right, and then the ensemble predictions on the right using the trained ensemble that I just talked about. And these have really become sort of the talking points and the, the sort of go-to forecasts 
for COVID in the United States. It is not to say that these are perfect forecasts. Uh, however, by doing this, we have, we have a better understanding of what they're good at and what they're not. And I think really importantly, uh, it gives us a better sense of, of where we need to move forward on the science. So both like what, what data sources do we need to improve, but also what do we need to improve in individual forecasts and how we can improve the way that we bring those together in ensembles and also the way that we communicate those ensembles and, and use those uh, in decision making on, on, the, on the flip side there. Um, lastly, uh, there's, there's uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people at this point who've been involved with all the work that I've talked about in one way or another. Um, so let me first like really acknowledge that group of people, which includes counties, states, people have been, uh, like helped us on figuring out how forecasts could be useful and getting the appropriate data available, but also the teams who've done a ton of work uh, making these forecasting models. A number of people at CDC who've been integral to these efforts, a number of other sort of organizations, and a number of people outside CDC who've had sort of key contributions to some of the work that I presented today. All right, and with that, I think maybe there's a couple of minutes for questions. Sorry, I went a little longer than I intended. Great, thanks for that really informative presentation. Um, do we have any questions for Mike? I think we have a, maybe time for one or two. That's good information, thank you. I have a, a, Andrea, did you have a question? I was just gonna ask, um, to what extent are, is your team interacting with um, like vector control or counties um, in the US to, to start filling in some of the gaps in the um, you know, vector data across the country? Yeah, so we have not had much of a chance to follow up on that. Um, what we we started uh, back in 2018, we started a work group with the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists. Uh, and so that has like representation for many different states. And so we work with a lot of counties through that uh, and try to connect with those vector control groups. The problem is a lot of those, like the people who are doing surveillance, they already sort of have the data and the people who aren't doing it uh, you know, they don't really have the resources to be doing it. So we're trying to interact with some of the people on the state level. Uh, and we're really getting those restarted now as we're trying to sort of re like get back into some of this work. So I do hope that we'll be able to do more of that in the future. They're, they're critical partners for this. Um, and I think this is partly a stepping stone uh, of sort of trying to build that relationship more and trying to help them figure out ways to, um, you know, I think take some of those steps more efficiently to help fill some of their data gaps. Yeah, great, thank you. Any last questions? Okay, well with that, thank you so much, um, Dr. Johansson for joining us today and uh, we'll see you all um, in March for the next 